Welcome everyone. I'm Ann Mason, a member of the program committee for the National Railway Historical Society's DC chapter. And I'm your host for tonight's presentation. I'm assisted tonight by Garen Goldsmith and Jim Perry. Our chapter's mission is to expand the public appreciation of railroads and their history through preservation and education. And we accomplish this through a variety of programs, including sponsoring a rail camp for a high school student, preserving and operating our beloved 1923 Pullman car, the Dover Harbor, maintaining a railroad library at Bowie Tower, Maryland, and publishing our monthly newsletter, The Timetable, Another way we fulfill our mission is by offering free public programs, including the one like tonight. Tonight, John Eldridge, the DCNRHS president, will tell us his saga of replacing the ancient battery on the Dover Harbor. And before we get started, just a few words about John's background. He was trained as an electrical engineer at the US Naval Academy in Annapolis. He spent 30 years on active duty serving as a submariner on five nuclear submarines. And this included serving as director of strategic plans and policy representing the United States on a NATO committee. After leaving active duty, John spent another 16 and a half years serving in civilian jobs related to the military. Now retired, John chased his early love of trains from his Boy Scout adventure on trains to DCNRHS, where he shares his leadership skills with us and applies his many technical skills to the Operations and Maintenance Committee to keep the Dover Harbor in working shape. Tonight, John will tell his tale, the year-long tale, a saga, to replace the battery in the Dover Harbor so over to you, John, for the tale of another chapter in the historic preservation of our beloved Dover Harbor. Well, thank you very much, Ann. I appreciate that kind introduction. I'm sure most of you have dealt with batteries along the way. In my life so far, I've dealt with AAA, AA, CD, C batteries, D cells, six volt lantern batteries, nine volt transistor radio batteries, 12 volt car batteries. With Dean Edmonds, I helped replace a big 12 volt battery and the diesel for starting our diesel generator on board Dover Harbor. There'll also be uh, those button batteries that go into watches, alarm clocks, flashlights, bathroom scales, the dang things are all over the place. Special batteries have gone into a radio controlled airplane, a Kodak Instamatic camera, and a 35 millimeter camera. Smoke detectors, garage door openers, all sorts of things. Even once we replaced the battery in a nuclear submarine. It had 124 cells and each one weighed 1500 pounds. The total of that battery's weight was heavier than the Dover Harbor. Then along came Dover Harbor and it was with his casual, typical innocence our chief mechanical officer, Jim Lilly, baited me with the casual phrase, hey, John, would you look into getting us a new battery? As it turns out, it would have been easier to replace the battery in the Hubble telescope. So here I was off on another venture. Let's get started. Here's what we plan to do. I'll introduce my co-host. We'll discuss the requirements, then some things about how we gathered up all the pieces together and how we finally put it in and tested it. If you do have a question that applies to a specific slide, in the lower right-hand corner is the slide number. If you just keep track of that slide number in case uh, we ask Ann to scroll back to a particular slide, that would be helpful in the question period. All right, next slide, I'll introduce the co-host. And there's no surprise there that once again, I've got Thomas, he's agreed to tolerate a Friday night presentation that has an electrical topic. Thomas believes that steam is the only way to go. And he was going around all day, electricity, bah humbug, bah humbug. So I've had about enough of that. So Thomas, just uh, be quiet, listen, and see what you get something out of it. Why do we need a battery in the first place? Because we've got the power from the engine and then we have our diesel generator on board the car. 
Why do we need a battery? Safety. If you look at the back of the car, you see the green arrow pointing to one of the two marker lights, what are essentially the same as the tail lights on your car. Any car that is at the end of an Amtrak train has to have marker lights, and those are our two. When the people that installed the battery system, they recognized the need for emergency access, and it would be good for the passengers and the crew to have some backup lighting in case they have to uh, depart the car when the regular electricity is no longer available. So there are some other lights that um, come off the battery. The one inside that rectangle is one part of the vestibule where people get on and off the car. And we do have a couple of more uh, lights off the battery. They're inside the car itself. I learned in the Navy, anybody, anytime anyone wants you to do anything, the place to start is what is the actual requirement? And a 49 CFR, that stands for Code of Federal Regulations. And that is where they talk all about everything to do with railroads in 49. It may be all of transportation. But the Code of Federal Regulations would fill up an entire wall. If you uh, other codes in it are 10, which is Armed Forces, and then everyone's favorite, Title 26, is the Internal Revenue Service. But anyway, we deal with Title 49, and it does have the requirement in U.S. law that they have to have marking devices. But that's all it says in the federal regulations. The next step is the Passenger Railroad Corporation Safety Manual by Amtrak says there has to be a battery backup. So now you've got the regulation for the marker lights. Now you have to have a battery. And this additional requirement says the battery has to last for at least two hours. Well, back uh, in June, I think of last year or July on a New Orleans trip, we noticed that uh, we were put on the battery for a while and uh, the marker lights were holding up, but the lights inside the car were showing signs of dimming and it was less than the two hour time. So we said, hey, we need to take a look at this and find out how our battery's actually doing. So we took a look at the old battery and as you can see, it looks pretty old. And what you're looking at there is a bunch of individual battery cells, like when you put two cells in a flashlight, uh, two D cells or C cells. Well, this battery had 26 cells and they're all connected together. We tested the battery and there was a wide disparity between the individual cells performance. Like when we put a load on the battery, some of the cells immediately went to zero volts. In other words, they were contributing nothing and the other cells were picking up the load. So we decided it was time for a replacement. So if you're gonna analyze an old battery, you need an old battery analyzers. And we noticed that there was low capacity, weak cells and they failed under load. We also noticed that there were some problems with the battery because those previous deficiencies were with the analyzers themselves. But here are uh, typical Dover Harbor mechanical workers, Mike Gingrich and Jim Perry analyzing uh, results of the old battery. It's gonna get a little technical in a couple spots, but this is basically what goes into making up a battery. First thing, you have to have two plates or electrodes. These are made out of two different types of metal, usually different, they can be similar, but one's a plus and one's a minus. And that's what gives you the electricity coming out of a battery because it comes through the electrodes. Now, to get the electrodes to work together, you have to fill it with some type of liquid called electrolyte. And usually it's a liquid but sometimes, like the D-cell batteries that you have at home, that uses a solid electrolyte. But you have to have something that conducts electricity to carry the uh, interaction between the two plates. Common electrolytes down there in the lower left are sulfuric acid. That's what's in your car battery. Nasty stuff. That lithium word, I think, is something that they use in the quite common today lithium batteries. Our particular battery uses potassium hydroxide which is if sulfuric acid is on one side of the scale, potassium hydroxide is on the other. But either one can conduct electricity and either one can be used in a particular application for a battery. Some batteries store the energy in the electrolyte, like the sulfuric acid, which a lead acid battery stores the energy in the electrolyte. Dover Harbor's battery does not. It stores the energy in the plates. And so during the charging and discharging, 
the electrolyte doesn't change at all. It just sits there, all of the energy is stored in the plates. So we looked at different types of batteries and we decided we had pretty good luck with the old battery, so we'll get a new battery just like the old one. And we did. The components, and this is a picture of the battery cell, the brand new one, and we uh, ordered 30 of these and we ended up using 26, but it's a plastic uh, see-through, we call it a jar. And up at the top, you can see the metal electrode. That's one of them. The other electrode is back behind it. There's a little uh, cell cap, which is a screw top that allows you to add electrolyte inside the battery. The cell jar made of plastic, the two fill lines where you keep the electrolyte level, and then the electrolyte fills up the rest of the cell. So if you want to try something at home, you can make your own little battery, depending on what you happen to have lying around your kitchen or your garage. And what we have at the bottom, that's a, a candle sniffer that was coated with a light bit of silver. Silver can be used as an electrode. The nail is a uh, galvanized nail, which means it's made out of some cheap steel, but then it's coated with zinc to cut down on the corrosion. So zinc is a good metal to use. And on the right is a copper penny. Copper shows up in a lot of batteries. Up at the top, I got a half of a lemon and over at the right is a little uh, cup full of vinegar. And those are both acids. So you hook those up and go to the next picture. And here you have two different uh, arrangements. They both are using the nail, which is zinc, and the copper, which is uh, the penny. And on the left, I used a lemon. And on the right, I used vinegar. And you can see uh, they both came out to produce about one volt. And you think, hey, why do I need to buy batteries? I'll just do like John said, buy a bunch of lemons and uh, get a couple of pennies and go to town. The only problem with this is this is these uh, arrangements under no load. There's no current flowing at all. So if you tried to put a little light bulb across that, a one volt light bulb, it would immediately go to zero, the voltage. Now, on the other side, those two were both acids. Here, I used baking soda, and that's a base. And acids and bases are like opposite ends of uh, what goes on with uh, those types of chemicals. And this one happened to put out 1.1 uh, volts, almost 1.2. The key point here, though, is that the electrolyte does not necessarily have to be an acid. And in our battery, it is not. Now. Each battery puts out only a certain amount of voltage. So this one puts out 0.68 volts, and this is the uh, vinegar, zinc, and copper. If you want more voltage, you have to have more cells. And here I did the same thing with two cells, and notice how the voltage, it should have about doubled, but there must be some disparity between the components that I used. But this shows how you get more voltage out of a battery that each cell will only put out about one volt. So you add up the different cells, and I ran out of coffee cups or I would have uh, run it up higher. But anyway, that's how we get more voltage. Household batteries like you buy at the store, those uh, C cells and D cells, they all put out 1.5 volts. That's it. They don't put out any different voltage at all. The little rectangular nine volt batteries, that's not putting out nine volts. That has six 1.5 volt batteries inside. They're just real tiny. So that's how you get nine volts out of such a small battery. Your car battery uses um, sulfuric acid and lead for both of the plates. It puts out, one of those cells puts out two volts. And most cars run on 12 volt batteries, so they have six cells in there. And the old ones you used to have to add water to occasionally, they would have six little, uh, tops that you could use to add water. Dover Harbor, that reaction between nickel and cadmium puts out 1.2 volts per cell. We needed around 32 volts, so just like the previous battery, we ended up using 26 cells. If you decide to go out and buy a Tesla, it uses one of these uh, lithium batteries. That arrangement puts out 3.7 volts per cell and I looked it up, they're between 3,000 and 7,000 cells in a Tesla battery. They combine those to get more voltage and also to get more capacity. So down at the bottom, if you want higher voltage, you use more cells. If you want it to last a long time, 
you use bigger cells, like that cell that we bought that you see there on the right. That's about four inches by two inches at the bottom. And you can buy those things that are as uh, big as a, a milk jug or even bigger for if you have a large application. So as it turns out, we ordered 26 cells. We ordered 25 cell connectors so we could connect the cells in series. And by those are little bars that you will see later that bolt between one cell and the next. We needed 10 pounds of potassium hydroxide, one pound of lithium hydroxide. When we got the battery manual from the Chinese manufacturer, they had specific items in there about how much chemicals you should use in the electrolyte. And by adding the one pound of lithium hydroxide gave our battery better performance when it got down below freezing. So that's why we went with the 10 pounds of potassium and one pound of lithium hydroxide. And we did end up having uh, three and a half gallons of distilled water to fill all the cells and you only used steam distilled water or other distilled water, nothing with any additives in it at all. You want pure distilled water to go into the battery from now until forever. Battery precautions. Battery is a device and if you screw it up, it'll try to give out all of its energy at one time. Now, if you take a pound of coal, it has seven times the energy that a pound of dynamite does. The thing about dynamite, it'll give you all of its energy at one time. It's very, very difficult to get all that energy out of a piece of coal at one time. So a battery can be dangerous if you allow it to try to give all its energy at once. Best thing to do is avoid shorting the terminals. In other words, don't let the terminals uh, have a direct path for the current to flow without having a proper load in between. Electrolyte can be nasty stuff. Sulfuric acid, uh, it'll burn holes in most metals. Potassium hydroxide will uh, tear up your skin and stuff. And potass strong, potassium hydroxide is called a base. And most drain cleaners that you have at home, Drano and stuff, that's a very strong base solution. They don't wanna use an acid there because the acid loves to go after metal and it might tear up the pipes. That would not be good. So you can have very strong bases that uh, can do damage too. If you uh, connect a lot of cells together, you can get uh, high voltage. And I think in a Tesla, they'll use something like 700 volts. We don't go anywhere near that. And 32 volts can uh, cause minor problems, but it's not the hazard that the big one, the higher voltages can be. If you try to get start to finish on one calendar, this is what it looks like. We first started recognizing it in June and we started the search process around the 20th of July. That's the first email that I could uh, dig up where I started looking for a battery. We ordered it on January the 11th and we installed it the week of April the 25th. A breakdown of how it worked was along these lines. I went to some of my Navy buddies because I had one guy that uh, I happened to work with while I was still employed that dealt with lithium batteries for the Navy. And they do have some hazards that we wanted to avoid in Dover Harbor. And when they put an aircraft carrier through overhaul, they built a special compartment for storage and charging lithium batteries. And it had special fire extinguishing capabilities and special ventilation because they do have certain problems. I looked for commercial suppliers in the US. I didn't get anywhere with that. It looked like all the manufacturers were there either in China or India. So uh, I joined this madeinchina.com organization, which got me access to directly to uh, put out our requirements. Called a couple of US companies that said, Yep, we used to make that, but now you have to go to China. Early in this year, I found a manufacturer in China and they said they'd have a battery manufactured 35 days after deposit. So then I started thinking about how do you get this battery from a foreign country through customs and into America? So I didn't want it coming over to San Francisco and then getting a phone call, hey Eldridge, somebody's gotta come out here and sign for this battery. So our board member, Richard Garabedian, was very helpful, and he connected us up with one of the people that, through his work, he had known, called, uh, Mr. Neil Burke. And Neil Burke took a look at the specific requirements of the contract and of the battery, and I learned some interesting things. 
one of the little clauses was just a code like XM350. He said that means that you own the battery as soon as it's manufactured and hasn't even left their production facility. So if there's a fire or if it's lost or damaged, it's up to you to go and figure out what to do to get it replaced. He advised use a credit card and don't use a direct transfer of money. We looked at shipping it by air or shipping it by sea and he said, hey, if it's gonna take 35 days to make it, 45 days by sea, he said 80 days is too long. Ocean freight's unreliable. He did say the company looks like a solid company. So I was reassured that we uh, had a chance to go for it. The company in China assured me they'd solve all the customs problems. And eventually uh, they did. The customs was not a problem at all. Richard's uh, succinct saying there that uh, this isn't like buying some uh, D batteries down at the drugstore. It's a little more complicated. He was right. So right after the first of the year, we put it on order. Uh, I got down here January 11th to place the order. On January 13th, they told me, oh, we may have some delays because of COVID and the Lunar New Year. And I, I just can't figure out why that delay wasn't recognized until after we ordered the battery. But anyway, we had to get it, so it went with it. Then they asked me, do you want it shipped wet? Which means, do we want the battery to be shipped with the electrolyte already in it? And of course we did. We wanted to do as little work as possible. So we said, sure, send it wet. And then two days later, they said, we can't ship it wet, but we can ship the chemicals for you. And we said, okay, that'll be all right. March the 21st, they said the battery was complete and total of 69 days. Then they said they're looking for a shipper. So they started looking and then they said, oh, we can't ship even the chemicals. We're just gonna have to ship just the battery. And I thought, oh dear, how am I going to go about finding chemicals? So I went back to the company in China and Chi, the lady in China, gave me a name of a U.S. chemical supplier who was in Colorado. And I, I called him up and he said, oh yeah, we can get the chemicals. Just let us know what you need. Meanwhile, they found two shippers that would uh, air freight it over to us. And somewhere between April 12th and the 22nd, they got it shipped. And next thing we knew, the battery was at Lake State Railway in Midland, Michigan. And this is the location where Dover Harbor had spent uh, since from about last October till uh, April, because it was getting the PC2A inspection done and also the uh, any work that was required by that. So Lake State Railway said, sure, we'll let you put it in up here. So we shipped the battery up there. Now, the man in Idaho who's getting the chemicals for us, he contacted his supplier who was in Colorado. And you notice that timeline is getting down to April 22nd. And Jim Perry and I are driving up there on April 25th. So we got onto a thing. We had to overnight hazardous material. And uh, that created a little bit of a charge, uh, not an electrical charge. This was a financial charge to get it up there. It was over a weekend. I think the 24th was a Sunday. And I looked at the shipping status as you can check online these days. And it said it was in Flint, Michigan, which is about 40 miles from Saginaw. And it said it was stop, unacceptable hazardous material. And I thought, oh my word, if they're gonna ship this back to Colorado or put it in some kind of impound place where I can't get it, for goodness sakes, don't move it. I'll drive up there or we'll get Jim Perry and I'll drive up there and we'll pick it up ourselves and we'll take it from there. But anyway, Jim Perry and I take off and we start going up there. And on Monday, the 25th, it said the chemicals are at Lake State Railway. So we thought we were getting all the parts together and we were going to be able to make a success out of this uh, lengthy process. Just to see a typical flight path, I don't know if the battery went direct, but uh, when you fly, it's just not a map that you go straight across. It does a uh, the airplane has to fly the shortest route, which if you look at a map, this is the shortest route, that red path. Total of about 7,800 miles that the battery went on its first trip just to get to Dover Harbor. You look at the cost. The original cost that uh, for the battery, 450, the connectors, and the shipping by air and insurance. If you add up those four numbers, that was the initial charge that we paid to the Chinese company. Eventually, we had to add in the chemicals and so uh, there it turned out a $2,500 expense for a battery uh, that started out with a $450 component. But it was a long distance. We did choose to ship it by air. So the decisions that helped support 
getting the battery replaced so we can meet the safety requirements on the car. Uh, Thomas took off. He said he was tired of listening about electricity, so he went out on a little run, but I hear him making some noise. All right, Thomas, I can see that your run got you a little bit. It looks like he got off track. What did you do, Thomas? Yeah, and uh, Thomas, I hear a ringing noise. Oh, it's your cell phone? Oh, is it a steam-powered cell phone? So we'll let Thomas get back with trying to get back on track and enjoying his run. So we'll start when the actual process of getting the battery into the car. Like we said, April 25th, we traveled. April 26th, we started up at Lake State Railway, getting through the process on that day, and we'll go have a couple more pictures. Getting all the components out, mixing the chemicals, and that day we filled the cells. This is what the old battery looked like. You've seen this before. You see the battery connectors going between the directly between the terminals. Those are their short pieces of metal. You see a couple of wires going in there and they uh, used a couple of wires instead of the connecting bars. They uh, didn't set it up just right and they ended up using wires, which makes no difference to the battery. And the little yellow round parts are a little flip top that you can lift it up and that's where you can add more water to the battery as necessary. So this is what we were working with and it served us well for 35 years. We're looking through the records. This is the original document for that battery that you just saw. Edison battery put it in, they're long gone from business. I tried to start with them. They, and they installed it May 2nd, 1986. And that right there, 26 cells, 23 connectors and two jumpers are right there on the manifest from the original document, supplying the original the battery that we replaced. Just for comparison, and this is a little bit off track. I know, Thomas, you were off track too. But this is what the DC panel looked like in uh, earlier configuration. And this is from the car, sister car to Dover Harbor, Dover Strait, at the Illinois Railway Museum. And you notice on the left, A is showing the screw type uh, fuses that were so common up through the 50s and 60s. And on the right are a couple of actual knife switches. Now, Illinois Railway still operates this car and those are the components that they use. But you show the next one is uh, compared to what, that's a Dover Strait on the left and Dover Harbor on the right. Previously, years ago, they installed a much more uh, modern electrical panel. So that's what we have for our DC distribution. This is our cell, again, the same picture that you've seen before, but this talks about the physical dimensions. And we were very careful about this because our battery cabinet is uh, not that big and we didn't have a bunch of room to uh, end up buying bigger cells. And so we had to size the electrical capacity of the battery to match what would go into the space that we had available. And this is a picture before it left China and the new battery weighed total about 130 pounds. This is where we pulled them out of the box and we lined them all up in our workspace. And if you can look carefully, you see each one has a little black cap. And that black cap completely seals the battery and that was used for shipping. They don't want any of the electrolyte to leak out during the shipping. And the only electrolyte that was in the battery was the residual left from when the Chinese company tested the battery before they shipped it. They had dumped all the electrolyte out and they put on the black caps that allowed no uh, more electrolyte to escape. So when we got the battery, there would be a little bit of residual uh, electrolyte inside it. But those are the black caps that they were shipped with. This is the setup for Jim Perry's laboratory. And we abbreviated that JPL. And when I told people that I went out to do some work at JPL, uh, if they get mixed up with Jet Propulsion Laboratory, uh, it's just not my place to correct any misconception. But anyway, I thought JPL had a nice ring, so Jim Perry's Laboratory. These are two spaces uh, right there. The Dover Harbor is right behind where the picture is being taken. This is in their roundhouse, but they gave us this space, and we made good use of it as a careful place to set up and be able to spread out all of our equipment in a safe and effective manner. If you go from left to right, on the far left, you can see the battery cells. The white package are stirring rods that Jim had bought for stirring the chemicals. Then there are pitchers. We had about seven of them. I thought, why do we need seven? But we did need seven. And they all had uh, graduations on the side, like you get in a chemistry uh, 
setup, a graduated cylinder for marking off all of the different uh, levels so we can fill and use the right amount. Then you see a voltmeter roll of tape. There's a blue package with a white top. That is boric acid. And the manual that the Chinese sent us indicated that when you're filling the cells, you should have a 3% solution of boric acid available to neutralize any of the potassium hydroxide electrolyte that may get spilled, either on your skin or on the cabinet or on the floor or anywhere. So Jim had purchased that too. You see the notebook down in front where we had our procedures and then a pair of safety glasses and taped up on the wall with first top left or emergency procedures in case we had a problem with the uh, electrolyte in any case. And then we also had copies of our step-by-step -step procedures pasted up on the wall. Uh, in the front there is a clever scale that Jim Perry uh, acquired for measuring the chemicals. You can set the container down on top of the scale and then zero out the weight so that any weight that you're actually reading is the weight of the chemicals going inside the container. And you don't have to sit there and start subtracting uh, 15 ounces for the container and stuff. Behind the scale, you see a bin with white. Those are white caps that have vent holes in them. Those are the ones that eventually have to go on the battery for operations because during the charging process, the battery may generate some gas and you want that gas to be able to escape without causing any problems. So those are the white caps that came with the battery. Here's a picture of Jim at work and he's uh, stirring the chemicals inside one of the pitchers, getting ready to go. Here he is again, filling the cells. And uh, on these pictures, the cells in the bin, all the black tops have been removed just so they can be ready to be filled. When we did mix the chemicals, it did uh, generate some heat and it said to let it cool to 20 degrees centigrade. So after we mixed uh, all the chemicals, uh, Jim and I took off and went and had some lunch and we came back and then they were down to the temperature that we could use it for filling the cells. It's kind of interesting. You add an innocent looking powder to water and it starts putting out heat. But here I am mixing... Uh, potassium hydroxide, and a precaution you always use with either strong acids or strong bases. If you're trying to mix the acid or base with water, you always pour the acid or base into the water. So you end up with a very diluted solution, and as you add more, the concentration builds up. If you were to take the water and pour it into the dry chemical potassium hydroxide, it could react very violently and spatter and generate heat. So we didn't do that. So safety is to pour it, the chemical into the water. And if you look outdoors right behind me, you can see every once in a while you get distracted, but nothing affects me. I mean, I'm not gonna turn my head just cause the train engine goes by, but it is kind of interesting to be working at an active railway yard. And here we are, this is the uh, track right outside. Our door that you were just looking out of is right behind that stop sign there on the left. And that's the one side of the roundhouse, but. Every once in a while, a train would come by, an engine or something. April 27th, this would have been Wednesday. We're getting ready to take the new battery, which we've now got it all, all the cells are filled. And this is a picture of the old battery in the uh, battery cabinet. The front of the cabinet drops down and you can slide the battery out for working on it. And we'll take this one out. There it is, as it's been disconnected and we've pulled it out. Here's the new battery. We brought a hand cart with us and we put the new battery on and uh, rolled it on down. The top of the picture, you see that orange barrel. That's where the battery is going. These are the two batteries. They're swapping a bit of information. I'm sure the uh, old battery's given the new battery some tips about how to enjoy the time, but that was where uh, they last passed and never to see each other again. Notice that the cells are not yet connected. So uh, Jim Perry and I got them, and these are all the cells sitting in the bin. It took us about 45 minutes of twisting and turning and moving this cell and moving that one to get them all to fit and to also get them arranged so that the connecting bars can go right from one cell to the next because you have to connect the plus terminal of one cell to the negative terminal of the next cell to keep putting the batteries together in a series configuration to get the voltage up to 32 volts. But we finally got them to all fit in one bin, but we have not yet put the connectors on. 
Now here you can see it's Jim Perry. The connectors are on. You can see the white caps on top of the battery that have the vent holes. And now the battery is connected so all the cells are working together. And I think that's reading about 33 volts. So this was before we even charged the battery. So our battery stores its energy in the plates. So once the plates are in, uh, I, they had it charged up when it left China, but no electrolyte. Once we added the electrolyte, it would uh, come up, the voltage would come right up and it measured 32 volts. Notice that the connectors are still bare though. They're, if we dropped a wrench or something on top of the battery, it could cause a short circuit. But we were able to assemble it using just the connectors. We did not have to use any jumper cables. The orange pieces on top of the battery are plastic covers to go over the connector bars. The Chinese manufacturer included those with it and that provides an extra margin of safety so that the bars are not exposed to anything. Now the battery's hooked up. You can see the uh, meter is over on the right and it's ready to be charged. Initial charge we did was four hours because that's all the time we had that afternoon. While we were charging the battery, we had some work to do inside the car. This is after we'd been at it for a while because when we left the car in October, all of the furniture was covered up in plastic to help preserve it and keep it clean while it was gone. We had about 60 pounds of laundry that uh, we had done back in October and we folded that and got that put away, those green towels or the hand towels that we used. Made the beds, we did some vacuuming and as much as we could to help get the car ready to go while we were waiting for the battery to charge. Okay, another uh, technical situation here. When we just filled the batteries with electrolyte, the voltage on the, each cell was about 1.3 volts. That's typical. I, I said earlier that our nickel cadmium battery is supposed to put out 1.2 volts. Those, this was a good indication. Then we hooked up the battery charger and charged the battery. That took uh, four hours one afternoon and then we did three hours the next morning. When we got done, while it was still being charged, we measured all the voltages on the battery and we got between 1.4 and 1.5, which is what you expect as the battery is being charged. The total voltage out of the battery when it was being charged was 40.5 volts. So this means uh, it's like heating up something uh, in your oven and you want the roast to come up to 170 degrees. So you heat that oven up to 350 and it starts dragging the roast up towards that temperature. Well, the battery charger puts voltage onto the battery that's above the battery voltage and it starts raising the battery voltage as it's storing energy. So we got it up to 40.5 volts. We turned off the charger and the battery voltage was 36 volts. Very good, there's, uh, and there's expected to be a drop when you go from being charged to not being charged. So the battery, brand new, fully charged, is putting out 36 volts. Then we put a load on it. We put the marker lights, the vestibule lights, and a couple of the lights from inside the car in a typical configuration that we thought would be how we would use it if we were operating on the battery. In two hours, the voltage had dropped from 36 down to 34 volts, not a problem. Then we increased the load by doubling it. We put in some uh, higher wattage bulbs. So we took the load from about 100 watts to 200 watts, and we ran it that way for three more hours, and the voltage dropped down to 29 volts. So that's with a total of five hours on some very heavy loads compared to what we expect. Now, our battery can go down to 26 volts. We uh, shouldn't use it below 26 unless we have a desperate emergency. But... We've got plenty of voltage uh, and plenty of capacity in our new battery. So we're very pleased that it came out as well as it did. So long to the old battery. I, I don't know of many batteries that last 35 years anymore, but it did its job well for a long, long time, a good rugged battery. And nickel cadmium batteries are known for being long lasting and giving good service. So we disconnected the meters, we shoved the battery uh, in the new bin, all those clean spanking brand new cells going into the battery cabinet, and then we shut the cabinet, and there we go. That's what it looks like when it's underneath the car. And there's where the battery cabinet sits. So the next time you're by Dover Harbor or watch it go by, you can just look and say, hey, that's the battery box going by. 
So one of the key components for safety and we replaced it to keep our car in a fine operating condition. Well, I'm either sad to say or glad to say that uh, completes my presentation and I'm available for any questions. Thanks, John, that was great. Uh, I don't see any questions in the chat, but we have a fairly knowledgeable group right assembled. So we'll open up the, the voice if you want to unmute yourself and ask a question. We're happy to have that now. And while people are thinking about the questions, um, Jim Perry, do you have anything you want to add to this presentation since you were also there in Saginaw? Well, I think uh, John did an excellent job of making me look good. <laughs> yeah, excellent. <laughs> excellent. No, it was a great. It was a great week. We had a good time, and and uh, it was felt like we were actually accomplishing something. Great. Um, I see that Donna Dolan has asked the question about how the old battery was disposed of. It's a very good question. Well, that was a concern. So we asked Lake State Railway, hey, we're going to change out our battery while we're up there. Do you have a means to dispose of the old battery? And they said, not a problem. We'll take care of it. So however their uh, situation is up there, uh, we left it with them. Now, I hope they don't ask us to come back and get it, but anyway, we'll act like we don't know them then, but uh, they'll know how to dispose of it properly. They, they do use batteries, this type of battery, uh, on an ongoing basis, so they do know how to deal with it properly. Okay. And Paul Flanagan unmuted himself. Are you ready to go, Paul? Yeah. <clears throat> Did you fill, the, uh, fill it up to the high mark? on the battery when you're putting the fluid in? No, we went. It has two we levels. Went, yeah, we went right. between the levels. You went between levels? Yeah. Because we, when we was doing the old batteries, we were never sure where actually we should have the level at when we was putting distilled water in there. Some guys filled it all the way up to the top. I tried to stay at the uh, high mark when I put fluid in it. The nice thing about this situation was that when we filled them, we we could see clearly see where the um, you can see you can look at them on edge and you can see where the film line is and where your electrolyte level is. So it's pretty easy to get it in the right place. When in real life, when you're out like back at Dover Park and trying to adjust the level, it it will be more difficult. Like Jim Jim said, the problem now is several of the cells are interior and you can't see the level mark. So we'll have to go by using the dipstick like we did before. Oh, so the battery will need water eventually. Yes. Yes. Okay. So I haven't lost my job entirely. No, <laughs> no, <laughs> no, Paul. <laughs> Don't retire yet. <laughs> that wasn't uh, Paul. <laughs> I'll probably do. I've been doing it for a long time. And I, I talked I talk to Jim a long time ago. You know, think we ever replaced these batteries? <laughs> probably 10 years ago. Yeah, well, that's probably what we ought to do. We got to get a good guy like John to get get off his butt and do something about it. Get it done. <laughs> well, I was the one that last watered it before the June trip to New Orleans, and I filled it to the top of the oh. plates. Oh, okay. That's why I wanted to know if it was, would continue to need water from time to time. Well, we do have electrolyte. We have the yeah. makings for additional electrolyte mm -hmm. when that's needed. You still got a couple spare batteries, right? Yes, yes, correct. Are still, they filled up? Or? No, no, they're empty. Well, so you I can't imagine. retire, John. You have to stay around. So are you and Jim got to stay around in case we ever need him. You have to mix the stuff up and put it in there. Well, the procedure's written up. <laughs> well, I, I, I can tell another rather interesting thing. I, it's not specifically with the battery. It has to do with the chemicals. Okay. Yeah. When I was having trouble uh, locating the chemicals, I called Lake State Railway and said, hey, do you have a chemical distributor there in town? He said, sure. So I called up the chemical distributor and I said, hey, I need 10 pounds of uh, potassium hydroxide. He said, we only sell it in 50 pounds. 
And I said, how much is that? And he said, $60. And I said, well, that's not so bad. I need one pound or two pounds of lithium hydroxide. He said, we only sell that in 50 pounds too. Hmm. Well, how much is that? And he said, $80. So I figure $140 isn't too bad. And I said, will you take the old chemicals back? Because I don't need all that. And he said, oh, no, no, we can't take them back. I said, well, I'll buy the whole amount, but can you, no, we can't take them back. Do you have a disposal company? So I called the disposal company and they would take both of them back. But the charge was $450 each to take mm -hmm. the leftover brand new material that I couldn't buy. So anyway, the man in uh, Idaho came through for us. So Donna wants to know, um, in the 1986 instructions you found, did we have it at Jessup? I guess that's at Dover Park. And if so, did you find it in the bar baggage car? And how many hours did you take to find these instructions? Well, that went pretty good. The only problem was there, there's, a, there's a bin with a lot of technical information. I think it came from Bernie and it was well labeled. But if you were gonna look up in a folder for battery, where would you look for it alphabetically? you would look for it under the letter B. Yeah. So I look and look and I get dis disappointed. And then I finally decide, well, I'll look through all the folders and it's under storage battery. So it's an S. <laughs> so, but once I found it and that's Donna, that's where it was in the baggage car in that uh, plastic bin that's got so much good technical information. And then she wanted to know about the old wires that went and did you use the old wires to connect the new battery to the Dover Harbor? Yes. Yes. Those are, those are pretty substantial wires that go in there. And if we tried to replace that wire, uh, that would be, I, I don't know how you spell nightmare, but it would be a challenge. <laughs> okay. Well, you, bas you basically got it wired now, so you only need the two wires. Mm -hmm. positive and the yeah. negative yeah that's yeah. right rest them are using your little uh connectors that's a good and job mr perry and mr president um how long do you think this will hold a charge without needing to be watered because you know every time the dover went out just about we had to and came home we had to water the battery the old battery again do you think it would go maybe a year without needing additional distilled water or do you have any idea? Well, the way we've been operating the old battery was we kept it on the charger almost all the time. So now mm -hmm. you've got the charger trying to put energy into the battery. And I think a lot of that was going out as gas driving uh, mm -hmm. vapor away and I think by operating at that, and so we haven't looked into what would be the optimum way to handle the battery, but I think it'll, you can take it off charge and, you know, charge it two hours a day. And if we went to that method when we were using it, uh, it would probably keep the water from uh, needing to be replaced nearly as often. Okay. John, didn't you have a problem with that actually charging last year, year before? You got to get some kind of relay or something to get it to. Uh, oh, that was uh, a relay problem, yeah. Was it was we that the charging the, relay or was that just the voltage relay? Well, we have it set up in Dover Harbor so that if we lose power to the car, there's a relay that will automatically shift those marker lights over to the battery. And that relay quit. So that didn't take away from charging or uh, any normal lineup, but it did take away the automatic feature of shifting over. But uh, Mike Gingrich took that and uh, ordered the new relay, and we got one exactly like the previous one. So that system is uh, functioning. Well, I know it was fixed, but I I wasn't sure what it was, the relay was for because I wasn't relay involved. Is, I wasn't involved in putting the relay back in. So I think that's why it went so smoothly. Probably so. <laughs> Everything. Did you all Paint the letters the increases when I'm not around, so you better watch it. <laughs> well, I, I could tell what one more related story if you're interested. Oh, Go ahead. Okay. Sure. Well, we uh, we we drove 
Jim's wife's car, who is Ann Mason, even though the one's Perry and one's Mason. And when we went to go out to dinner the first night, we had gotten our stuff out of the back of the car. And it's got one of those lift up hatches and all that stuff. And we got in the car and we were getting an alarm from the back window from lifting up the, the hatchback or whatever you call it. We couldn't figure it out. We looked in the instruction book and we tried this and we tried this and we couldn't figure it. It was like nine o'clock at night. So I decided I'll, I'll call a Toyota dealer. And so I call a Toyota company out in Santa Monica, California. And so I had it on speakerphone and it says Toyota of Santa Monica. And Jim looks at me and says, why are you calling California? I said, because they'll be open. <laughs> I got somebody from the service department and the window can be opened separately from the door. And that was it. That window was not seated and the car was uh, not letting us go anywhere until we seated it. But when in doubt and you're in an Eastern time zone, call early enough that the Western time zone is still open. I learned a lot from John. <laughs> Did you all paint the lettering on the battery box while you were out there? No, that was done already. Oh, okay. That was a previous requirement by the Amtrak inspector. It's a good thing it was labeled because Jim and I may have put it in with the air compressor. <laughs> <laughs> no, I would have said the retention tank for A. <laughs> so Donna wants to know... Uh, about the Amtrak inspection and did Amtrak check the battery during the inspection? I think we had the inspection done before we replaced the battery. So My I, impression was that the completion of the PC2A was after that and they did check the, the ability to maintain the marker lights for the two hours. Oh, I don't know. I'm sure they didn't dig into the battery to verify that. Well, that that was a fascinating story. And I will just echo Scarlett's comment is um, as Jim as sorry, John started off saying it's easy to say just replace the batteries. But as she said, holy cow, that was complex undertaking. And I think we all appreciate very much all the work that went into what you two guys did in preparing to change out our 35-year-old battery so that we could be Amtrak certified and ready to go. So thank you both for- Can I just that. add one thing? That mm -hmm. Anne was the one that really uh, picked <laughs> up on my, I bought a lot of the equipment yeah. uh, before it was, I was properly supervised. And so she got the heavy duty aprons and the heavy duty gloves. And, uh, and so that, that, <clears throat> that just comes from many years as a chemist in the lab <laughs> with safety first. <laughs> so thank you both. And thanks, John, for that wonderful yet to be named saga of the trans make making a new battery for the Dover Harbor. I have one humorous question left for John. Oh, Wayne, go ahead. <laughs> With all of Thomas's grousing at the beginning of the program, <laughs> electricity, bah, hung up. What did Annie and Clarabelle have to say about all of that? <laughs> <laughs> they try to stay aloof from, from some of Thomas's persnickettiness. Okay. <laughs> yes. Yes, they, they also try to help uh, keep him in line, if you will. <laughs> and once again if you like this presentation and many of you have seen some of these other presentations if you want to see them again check out our youtube channel so with that we're going to say thank you for attending and this was a great presentation thank you john uh, with commentary from jim and great conversation from all of you good night thanks john jim Good night, all.